Okay, and then finally, when this webinar ends, you will get a very quick survey link. We would love to have your feedback, love to know if this was helpful, um, and just getting your uh, thoughts on it, and it helps us improve our webinars moving forward. So with all of that out of the way, I am ready to get into the speaker introductions. I have two amazing business owners, entrepreneurs, experts in the field with me today, and I cannot wait to introduce you to them. First, we have Viri Diana Ponce. Viri has provided training, coaching, and consulting services through her business, VP Consulting, in both Spanish and English to over a thousand entrepreneurs since 2014. She supports clients in developing financial projections, managing finances, accessing capital, and strengthening their food operations. Barry uh, draws on 15, over 15 years of experience of accounting, finance, food, entrepreneurial experience, and mission to empower, enrich, and educate her community. Welcome, Vidi. Thank you. So happy to be here. Wonderful. And next, we have Dr. Penny Mickey. And um, we're so honored to have her here today. Penny is the owner and operator of the Memphis-based gourmet popcorn business, Mickey's Popcorn. Penny worked with her husband to create a business that blends the nonprofit with the for-profit world on top of amazing flavors like Oreo and Kentucky bourbon caramel. Penny has firsthand experience of preparing her business um, and maximizing her profits. So welcome, great to have you, Penny. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Yay, okay, we've got so much to cover, so I am gonna get right into it. And Vidi, I'd love to start with you. Can you tell us um, how does pricing strategy play into maximizing your profit margins? Yes. So there's a direct impact and it could really be the difference between making money or not, because when we are developing and implementing a pricing strategy, an effective pricing strategy, then we are doing things like we are analyzing our costs, which means that hopefully we'll be able to cover all of those expenses. We're doing things such as understanding the market demand, competition, we're understanding our consumer behavior. And that means that if we have the right price, that will incentivize people to purchase more. That could also increase revenue, increase loyalty. And then it'll also mean that we'll be able to leverage discounts. I have a quick example. I had a client who a couple of years ago was selling a popsicle. And she said her pricing just based on what everybody else was doing. And she priced it at $3. This was a couple of years ago, keep that in mind. And when we started calculating out her cost, we calculated that it cost $1 to make her product. So now we have $2. And then all her other expenses, so all her other operating expenses, rent expenses were over a dollar. And then, so we have $1 left. And then I realized that she was giving a dollar discount, leaving her with zero. And so that happens really, really often when we don't take the time to implement or develop an effective pricing strategy. So it has a direct impact. Wow, that's such a good point. And it's kind of surfaces the topic of you've got to know your numbers, you know, because the $2 profit was sounding pretty good, but now we're at zero. We don't love that. <laughs> we don't love exactly. that. <laughs> exactly. My goodness. And Penny, I would love to have your thoughts on this as well. Yes, happy to share. So for Mickey's Popcorn, our pricing strategy really involves tactics around people and places. Um, for us, you know, it started off with really knowing our target customer and where they're going to purchase our product. So it's the who, the people, and the places where they're going to purchase it. So again, our business is a gourmet popcorn company. We're consumer, a consumer packaged good. And our flagship flavors are made with top shelf spirits. So our licensed co-branded flavor is a Tennessee whiskey caramel. 
and it places well in gift shops, event venues, hotels. It lands on the shelves in these places between eight and $10 per bag. But now we're about to launch in Kroger. So now we're going into the land of retail, large grocer. Yes, we're very excited about it, but it's gonna land on the shelf at Kroger at $6.99 a bag. And part of this reason is because now you're looking at basically the customer that's at Kroger is really the, the curious person about the product because we're a new brand. It's a, it's a new flavor, an interesting flavor. And it's also individuals who maybe have already purchased the popcorn at one of these other venues, gift shops or a hotel or some sort, some sort of event venue. And now they want to repurchase our product because they liked it in that venue. So they may be willing if they're at the casino or the gift shop to spend eight to $10. But if you're shopping at Kroger and this is just an, one item that you have on a long list of really expensive groceries, if we landed it on the shelf at Kroger at eight to $10 a bag, we probably wouldn't sell. So that's an example of pricing strategy and how it does differ based on the customer and where they're, where they're gonna actually purchase your product. That's an excellent point because you're right, your expectations as a consumer, totally different at a gift shop than it's gonna be when I'm filling out my cart at the grocery store, which is like a whole thing these days, let me tell you. So it's <laughs> such an excellent point. Um, okay, so when we think about you know maximizing our profit margins, one of the things that can do that is keeping down our costs. So um, Vidi, I'd love to start with you. How can we identify and reduce unnecessary costs in our business? Yeah, I love this because this is something that I do with the majority of my clients. So I would say we really want to start with understanding our cost structure. So if you are making a food product, right? I would start down by writing out your ingredients, really understanding what the cost of your ingredients are, the packaging, and any of the costs associated with you being able to produce that food item. And this can also be applied to if you have any other type of like product and a service-based business. So really start by identifying and knowing what your cost structure is. And then from there, what I would do is on a monthly basis, this is what I do with my clients is that we review their profit and loss statement. And what we do is that we start out by actually looking at the revenue and then going into the different expenses and then really identifying what are the factors that made these expenses either go up or down. And then really asking ourselves, one, do we understand what all the costs are? Because you'll be surprised. Sometimes there's some sneaky costs in there or subscriptions that you forgot about. And so if you're reviewing it, you'll be able to catch those and then also being able to identify like, are these still necessary for my business? I was just doing this exercise with a client and we realized that there were some personal expenses in there. And it was only until we drilled down that we're like, ooh, that probably shouldn't be there. So she was able to switch over those personal expenses to her personal account. And then she also realized that there was opportunities to negotiate with some vendors. So she ended up calling her phone bill company because she's like, you know what, I can negotiate a better, a better deal with my cell phone company. And she did end up getting that. She was so happy. She, she texted me earlier this week. And then also just with that in mind, you'll be able to negotiate with vendors. So if you're reviewing your expenses on a monthly basis, you'll be able to see like, you know what, maybe I can get better pricing on X either ingredient or material. So I would also try and negotiate with your vendors and see if you can get better pricing. Purchasing in bulk can also be really, um, could be really helpful. Yeah, I, that makes so much sense. Making sure that everything that's included makes sense and then trying to get those prices down on the things that we can. You can always ask, you know, the worst thing they're going to say is no. So yeah. My client was so proud after we did that exercise because she was able to remove so many things off of her 
of off her PL, right? And just reduce those expenses. And so, yes, like we can take action. And if we do that on a monthly basis, then we'll be able to take real time action instead of waiting till the end of the year to figure it out when we're doing our taxes. Yeah, excellent point. And then you can kind of start saving immediately. I love that. Um, and Penny, same question for you. Uh, how do you address and identify those unnecessary costs? Yes, well, for us, it starts with, you know, obviously knowing your cost, which sounds like such a small, small thing, but it's, it's, it's really the thing. So it's for us, it's knowing our cost and knowing ourselves. So with us, we are promoting a premium product, right? And so there are certain ingredients that for us, because of the, the class and the grade that we're using, you know, if someone, would, someone may come in and say, well, why do you have to use that grade butter? Well, we could use cheaper butter, but it could potentially impact the taste and the end result of the customer experience. So we, we really don't want to change the type of dark brown sugar that we use and the type of butter that we use. Um, and so for us, it was having the courage to actually um, negotiate. So we knew that with our identity, we didn't want to go for cheaper products on purpose. Um, but we did have an opportunity to go back to Uncle Nearest, who is the distillery that we uh, have our licensed co-branded product with and said, hey, we're having to buy this over the counter. Number one, it's very inefficient to have to run to a liquor store and pay, and pay the same price that anyone else that walks into that store. And when we started to talk about volume and about how if we can't access it at a cheaper rate and if we can't access it more efficiently, we'll have to like push the unlicensed version of our Tennessee whiskey popcorn. And as a result of that conversation, now we're able to get the alcohol directly from the distillery and at cost, which is really wholesale. So that literally made our uh, cost of the alcohol contents in, in each bag about 40 cents cheaper, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, if, if you're retaining an additional 40 cents off of your um, profit, when you start to scale, it adds up quickly. So those are just some areas, understanding who you are and your identity, places where you won't cut corners, and then places where you may not have thought you could cut corners, but you don't know until you have the courage to ask and negotiate. <laughs> Oh, so good. And also every time you talk about that Tennessee whiskey bourbon popcorn, so my mouth just starts watering. It sounds so good. So I'm I'm glad that it is here and here to stay. But I think that's, you know, just some excellent points. And I really love all the business owners who are really, you know, taking this in. Like maybe if you start thinking of some things and if you want, even drop them in the chat. Where are you maybe identifying? some of those places where you are willing to cut corners and then to Penny's point where you are like, this is part of my identity and that's, we're not doing that. I love that. Um, okay, our next question, we've talked a lot about finances. It's the big one, you know, it can be scary, um, but what financial metrics are most important for small business owners to monitor when they're trying to increase these profits? Uh, Vidi, let's start with you. Thank you. And I just want to say, I really loved what you were saying, um, Dr. Penny, about not having to, it's not always about having to like change up our recipes, right? It's not that we're not compromising quality. So I thought that was such a, such a great point. And then also what you mentioned about like the 40 cents, it really does add up because there's a lot of, and I'm going to get to your question, Brittany, it's tight, tied into this, but, um, a lot of times we don't think that this 40 cents makes a difference or that, yeah, or like a dollar, like with my client who was giving a dollar discount on her popsicles, she's like, it's only a dollar, but at the end of the day, it can have a big impact on your profit margin. And it can be the difference of you being profitable 
or not, especially if you are in, for example, in the food industry. And that's where uh, the majority of my clients are women in the food industry. So those are, that's what I, I know a lot more of, like the cost structure. And for people in the food industry, the profit margins are really, really small. We're talking about for single location restaurants, the profit margins like 4%. For catering, it's like 6% of profit margin. So that's what you have at the end of after you pay all of your expenses, what you have left from your sales. And so it can make a difference. And we do have to pay a lot of attention to these numbers. And so I would say that a couple of financial metrics for us to keep out, um, to be on the lookout for is we really want to understand, like, go back to your cost structure. It really does begin with understanding all of your expenses. And so if you are making a product, I would say really understanding what your cost of goods sold are and really looking into your industry and learning as much as you can about the industry and what what's going on for example with the food industry cost of goods sold should be at no more than 35 percent for single location restaurants for payroll you should be no more than 35 percent of your sales should be going to cover your payroll rent 10 percent and so that we can try and aim for like a 10% profit margin. So I would say that we really want to understand our industry so that we can compare ourselves to that and say like, all right, if we're in the food industry and my payroll's at 50%, then I know that's a really key area where I need to pay attention. And that can even give you ideas of like, hey, am I paying too much in overtime? Are my hours too long? Right. So it helps you pinpoint like what area you should be focusing on for cost of goods sold. For example, for food, it's at 35 percent. But if you're making, let's say, candles and I don't know what the benchmarks are for candles, but if we would find that out and let's say we learn that it's at 50 percent and we are at a 40 percent profit margin, then that could be a really good sign for your business. And we could, if there's other areas where maybe you're a little bit higher, then you could decide to focus on, on those areas first. So I would say, understand your cost structure, right? Understand your cost of goods sold. Take a look at your payroll because those are typically the areas where businesses spend the most money. Yeah, makes so much sense. And I think it all just continues to tie back on you've got to know your numbers and you've got to be looking at them. Uh, so it it makes sense. You'll be able to see some of those things. And Penny, I'd love to throw it to you as well um, to talk about the financial um, metrics to keep an eye on. Definitely. Um, I thought for this question, I'd highlight um, an area that is beyond just whether or not you're in food or what, what type of product you have. If you are a product-based business and you're not storefront only, shipping and freight are going to be expenses that are really tough to control because they're going to they're gonna vary by weight, by dimensions, by where you're shipping a product. Um, and so the for us, what is really support, like the decisions that have supported us to be able to help maintain control of uh, shipping and freight costs um, have really been number one with getting a good relationship with a shipping partner. That relationship is going to allow you to gain certain types of discounts that you're going to want, especially if you're shipping um, direct to consumer because shipping costs vary if you're shipping to someone's, to a residence versus to a commercial facility. So understanding all of the different variables that can impact your shipping and freight costs is gonna be critical. The other thing that you can do if you say to yourself, we wanna still ship, but we really don't want to have to always be, be beholden to trying to understand the shipping game. Another option, is thinking about other online marketplaces that you can sell your products and goods to where you drop ship to a single location. So you're sending one parcel and then they are fulfilling your orders on your behalf that gets you out of trying to figure out the shipping for every package. Um, there's some there's some things that you have to, um, that you'll kind of like sacrifice, right? Because you'll, in some of those instances, you'll give up a commission or a fulfillment rate. 
Um, but doing the numbers to compare what it costs for the time for you or your staff to actually pack the box and pack, cover the shipping rate on the front end versus if you just drop ship a parcel to a third party logistics fulfillment partner is going to be critical for any type of product that is being sold direct to consumer. Um, I'll throw this out there for the, for the folks who are in services, because at one point in time, I've, I've I've had my foray into the world of consulting uh, and, and, and having my own consulting firm. One of the things that's critical is making sure that you don't just charge the rate that you would expect to receive if you were working by the hour or if you were kind of on the clock. You've got to build in what you want your hourly rate to be anywhere from 30 to 40 percent for what the benefits would be if you were on a job. Right. So if you were getting health insurance, life insurance, disability insurance, dental, um, all of those things that are in a in a company benefit package, that's typically 30 to 40 percent. So you're going to have to do the math between hourly rate plus this benefit, then add your tax, because then you're going to have to still pay taxes uh, on this income as well. So making sure that you um, factor in those three components as you set your services rate is going to be critical. Because if not, then you're, it's, it's, it's the same story as though you were selling a product. It's you think you're, you know, you're just getting your hourly rate, but then you're missing out on all of these other two things that are actually real costs um, to providing your service. So shipping and making sure you count all of the components for um, the proper rate if you're a service provider. Oh, so many good, so many good details in there. And you set me up, Penny, for this next question so well. So thank you so much. Um, so you mentioned in there, you said that you have to factor in the time. Um, and we know a lot of times that especially business owners, they can be weary of investing back into their business, especially in the early, early stages. Um, but is there a time when um, investing can actually increase your profit margins overall? And uh, Vidi, I'd love to start with you. Yes, absolutely. So we can think about like investing in areas such as like either like marketing or technology, equipment, uh, purchasing in bulk, doing some employee training that those can all lead to us being more efficient and effective in our business. Um, one of the things I see a lot with, with my clients is that they are, they're really busy running, running their business and they're really good at whatever their product is or their services. And they leave, for example, the bookkeeping till the end and they don't have a budget necessarily for a big bookkeeper and so a lot of times I have them really think about like can you invest in a program like QuickBooks so that then we can do these reviews on a monthly basis so we can save us some more time instead of you spending hours doing it either manually or putting it off and so that's a I think a good example where you can invest in technology and it can help you out with building some like efficiencies in your in your business or hiring a bookkeeper. A lot of times like we think we have to do everything in our business and we really don't, right? But we either have to get the technology because it'll help us out saving time or hiring an expert if we have the budget. So I would really think about, you know, is there a part of your business that you can improve the process? Is there, can you gain efficiency if you buy either a new piece of equipment or hiring someone? Um, can you increase your capacity if you do, for example, hire someone so that you can produce more or be able to serve more, more folks? So I think that we can, we can always invest in our business, even if we're starting out, even if we're an established business. So I would ask, can I improve my process? Can I gain some efficiency? Can I hire someone um, to increase capacity? So there's, yeah, there's different moments in, in our business. And I think that it's, I think it is really important for us to also think of if we do invest, what will the results, potential results be? 
Yes, excellent. I love that. Just like letting yourself, giving yourself the space to pour back into your business and recognize that your time is so valuable. And Penny, uh, I'd love to hear from you as well on this. Yes. So for us, our really our major investment has been, and I totally agree with everything that Beauty said, um, making sure outsource appropriate functions. If you're not the expert, if you're not an accountant, for example, uh, having, just having a system in place like QuickBooks are definitely all things that are, are steps that are, are very doable steps. For us, um, our major investment really came um, uh, in the form of commercial real estate and capital improvements. You know, we, we were a, a business that was renting uh, a commercial kitchen from a church when we started out. That's where we housed our single piece of popcorn equipment um, that did everything on that one piece. Um, and we had to decide were we going to continue to be a popcorn company operating under a food cottage, cottage law, which is perfectly fine and nothing wrong with it, or were we going to boost our capacity and scale to be a licensed food manufacturer. And, uh, and we decided on the latter. And one of the reasons why we were able to make such a giant leap, it's still scary. Um, but one of the stories that we kept telling ourselves that we still believe to be true is that worst case scenario, if we just total bust in popcorn, we're real estate owners. We still have real estate. So we, we can leverage the real estate even if the popcorn element doesn't work or doesn't go as planned. Um, and so we did that. So we actually, you know, we purchased new equipment, but now we had a building to actually place equipment within. So we got beyond just our really small machinery and went into more commercial size machinery um, in our new facility. And then the next thing that we just completed because we have an accountant that we have on retainer is we've now expanded to where we have a separate LLC that owns the commercial property. So now we have Gratis Holdings that is the commercial real estate company <laughs> that you know, operates in parallel to the, the food consumer packaged goods business. And we did this because we, had a, we invested in a consultant that said, you know, you can get more tax deductions if you place your property in its own LLC had no idea that that was a thing because I didn't know an LLC could basically be a piece of land, but it can, and it gets you more tax deductions for your business. So we're, that was our investment. So it was the wisdom of the accountant that helped us kind of like close the loop on what we needed to do with this piece of commercial real estate that we purchased. So, um, those, those two, the, the property and the wisdom is, is, are the two areas that we definitely invested in and it's benefited us. My goodness, speaking of wisdom, my, I'm learning so much. I don't got a popcorn business or a commercial property or nothing. I'm ready to go, Penny. I am ready. But I wanted to hit on this because you said you, you got some expertise. Now, um, you know, both Vinny and Pink, they're, they're very, very smart people, you know what I mean? And if you have your business, you can have a lot of knowledge and you can eventually find these same laws and things, but at what cost, at what time investment and whatnot. And you working in your business, creating products and whatnot, that is, um, that's where you shine. And so bringing these other people in and allowing them to help support you in that uh, it just gives you so much time back. So I know it's hard. I know every time we talk about this, people are, it, it can be so difficult, but I'm going to drop some links for you in the chat because I want to, want to let you know that Vidi here, she does coaching. She does free coaching sessions with AOF. Um, so if you're wanting someone who can give you a little bit more insight, Vidi is part of an amazing team of coaches who can help you with that. So I'm going to drop that in there. So you guys have some place to go. You want a little more one on one and I see these great questions in the chat and we are going to get to them, but for our last and final official question before we start moving to our live Q and a. Um, what are some common financial mistakes that business owners make that impact profit and how can we avoid them V I'd love to start with you. Yes, thank you so. 
a couple of things that I see that are really common is that people will set prices just based on competition. And I see that all the time, right? So yes, it's good that we're, that we're taking a look at what the competition is doing, but remember that you don't know what their cost structure is. We don't even know if they're making money, right? So it could be that we are using the same prices as them, but maybe they're not making money or maybe they've had a long-term relationship with vendors. And so their cost for an item is really, really low. So I would say, yes, it's part of you developing your pricing strategy. And yes, we need to understand what the competition is doing, but it takes a little bit more than that, right? It talks about, it, it's really about understanding your cost, understanding who your clients are, right? Like Dr. Penny was saying, like really understanding, like what are they looking for? What's what's gonna motivate them to purchase, right? And so I would say like, I would really caution with like, don't only go with that strategy. And with that said, Something that I see a lot as well is that people underprice their products and their services. And I see that so much with women, with our BIPOC community, that we think that people aren't going to purchase a certain product at like a higher price point, or we feel bad for charging, for charging more, or we think that that's going to really attract clients, we think that that's going to set us apart, right? That that's going to be a key differentiator and not always. Okay. Not always. I always tell my clients, like, do not use this strategy unless you have a really good cost structure and you have the volume. There has to be a couple of things in place so that that strategy works for you, right? Like you've put in all this time to develop either this product or this service. Remember we're paying taxes on this money as well, right? So whatever revenue is and then minus our expenses, we're still paying taxes on that. So I just really want to caution everybody that when we are setting the prices, that you really take the time to understand the cost, your consumer, and you add some more, right? You have to add some more because you're probably still not charging enough. And then as Brittany was saying, like there's there's experts Axion Opportunity Fund has several business coaches that can also help you review your pricing structure. Um, when I work with people, I almost get all the time, I get my clients to increase their prices because they're typically too low. And I think one of the things that makes me really happy is when my clients come back and they're like, BD, no one said anything. Like no one said anything about my price being like a dollar or two dollars higher. And I'm like, yes. And how do you feel? They're like, amazing, because now with $1, $2, or even 40 cents, it could make a really big impact on your profit and the money that you're getting. So don't go for the lowest price all the time. And then track your revenue and your expenses. I would really, really consider like using a system like either like QuickBooks, some sort of accounting system. So you always have access to review your financial statements. And you don't have to do it by yourself. Remember that. Yes, there is a community to support you. Um, I love that. Uh, yes, and charge more. <laughs> charge more. Look, really look at it. Um, <laughs> okay, and Penny, I would love to throw it to you as well. <laughs> I'll give just a real quick one so that we can have time to jump in the questions. Um, I think for us, um, definitely for folks, if you're, as you're launching any kind of new product, um, making sure that you do your research and uh, avoid mistakes that make you have any kind of do-overs. I know for us, it was like a really small mistake, but there was a mistake on our new packaging that entire batch, 3,000 packages um, had to be basically, you know, totally done away with. Uh, we just, it just, we just couldn't use it. So definitely making sure because when you start to grow or expand, you're probably thinking about, okay, we're going to buy in bulk now. We're going to buy this large amount, but please triple check before you buy large amounts of anything. <laughs> 
those are just horrible. Those mistakes are just not fun to live through. So triple check everything. Yes, triple check. <laughs> um, so excellent. Okay, we have gotten some really great questions like in the chat and in the Q&A. So we're going to jump right into them. So um, the first question we got was from Jackson, and he says, how much uh, do I need to have in my account before I hire? Um, I'm guessing like my first employee or my first person. And he has a clothing and apparel brand online that sells retail and B2B. So um, I think I'm gonna start with uh, Viri on this one and see what your thoughts are. Great, I was just writing down some notes, uh, a couple of suggestions. So first of all, it's, it's going to depend. Um, it depends really also on our level of like comfort and of risk that we're willing to take on. But what I would suggest is having at least two months of operating expenses in your bank account. So that could really depend on the size of your business. And then what I would also say is that I'd also want to have like a couple of days of training in my bank account. So to be able to cover their, their training, because I know for a lot of small businesses, we go directly into hiring the, the employees and then we put them to work. And then, and there's a lot of turnover with small businesses. I feel like that's one of the biggest challenges that I'm seeing with a lot of my clients right now. And so it is important that we invest time into training our employees, letting them know like what's our mission or vision or values. How do we address issues, right? Like showing them if you have equipment, how to safely use the equipment, showing them, you know, if they're going to be client facing, um, showing them how to address like customer issues and customer service. So I would say I would want to have at least two months of operating expenses in my bank account, plus being able to cover a couple of days for training and maybe their first payroll in my bank account before I hire them. And the other suggestion that I would have is also really think through like, how is this employee going to help you out? either generating more revenue or gaining capacity because we want to make sure that you will have you'll still be able to have positive profit margins excellent so many great points and you're right like that overturn in, in employees that can be really costly so having that good foundation and penny anything to add Yes, because we've had to be very creative um, around this topic for us. Um, I can say it helps to have a 16 year old that's six foot two and 235 that you can put to work. But if you don't happen to be in that situation, <laughs> um, a couple things that are kind of non traditional ways. One is some companies may be well positioned to engage with a factoring partner. Look it up, factoring. So these are our companies that will front you payroll if you have a contract. So for example, if the if you're wondering if you have enough money because you've got to wait to be paid. So if you if you're waiting, if you have to wait, for example, 45 to 60 days to get paid for a product or a service, there are factoring companies that will basically pay for, I mean, they, they charge a fee, but they'll pay your payroll on your behalf while you wait. Um, operate somewhat like a line of credit. So that's one way. Um, kind of a, a couple of other ways that, that we um, address this as well is if you already have hired them or if you're hiring them, look for ways that you can um, look for tax credits. So there's work opportunity tax credits if you hire individuals with, with certain profiles or certain personas. Um, that you can actually get tax credits for hiring those individuals. So you may not really save money on the front end, but you do save it at tax time. Um, the third way is looking at partnering with nonprofit organizations. For example, although we have a parallel nonprofit, we also partner, for example, with a nonprofit organization that provides work experiences for um, autistic youth and young adults. And so they do a really good job of basically being able to handpick the right type of um, employee 
And those organizations actually pay the hourly rate, the wage for, so, so it's, they're, they're getting funding from like the, the state vocational rehabilitation dollars. And so we've used those individuals to like put together our boxes. For example, they're our corrugate team and they're a part of, they're very much a part of our workforce, but we've never paid their hourly rate. So that's another way as well is to think about if you have a product or a service that you can get the um, some hours through those kinds of partnerships. Yes, I, that is so cool, first of all. And just to be really creative when you're thinking about hiring, there are other options out there for you. So great. And OK, our next question comes from Rachel. Uh, any suggestions on good marketplaces? Um, we are limited due to our distributor agreement, but wondering if there are others that we could use. And Penny, I saw this come up when you were chatting about your experience. So I wanted to take it to you first. Yes, and set, remind me again, say it again, um, the last piece of the question. Yeah, of course. So um, we are limited due to our distributor agreement, but wondering if there are others we could use. It's going to depend on the limitations of your distribution agreement. And so it, I can, to start off, be pay very close attention to what you sign in the first place, <laughs> because sometimes you can unnecessarily limit yourself for no reason. Um, there are still ways around it. One of the things that uh, I would suggest is if you find yourself really kind of like spinning about it is part of the investment that you can think about is people talk about accountants, but we have a broker. So we actually have a, a specialty food broker that helps us navigate all of our distribution um, contracts, partnerships. They understand, you know, you know, they're working on your behalf. They understand kind of what's a good contract versus what's not a good one and what not to sign. So if you have not engaged a broker, I do highly um, recommend it. Brokers are going to take a percent fee of, of sales that they broker on your behalf or with distributors that they connect you with. Um, but there is almost always a way out. Um, if you are with one of the national distributors, Unify, KHE, they're tougher to, to navigate. You almost need legal representation to navigate away from those. Hence the reason why we're not with either one. And I don't know if we ever will be. Um, they're right for some companies and some businesses and not for others. Um, so when in doubt, that very well may be an instance that you might be in an extreme scenario where you need legal representation or you might just be able to pick the brain of a good broker to help you navigate it. I'm on mute. Wow. <laughs> Ooh, it's like my first rodeo leaves. <laughs> but no, that's an excellent answer. And Rachel is sending lots of love on that answer as well. So that's great. The next question, I'm going to uh, kick it to Viri because it popped up during your section. Uh, William has his own engineering consulting practice, uh, which he's trying to grow. Um, what are insights in adjusting hourly rate to new customers? Yeah, thank you. So I would start out by researching the market, right? So really understanding. So what are other um, other businesses doing? But as I mentioned earlier, that's not the only thing we're going to factor in when um, adjusting our price. I would also consider your experience and your area of expertise. So how long have you been doing this? Because as we spend more time in our field, you're probably gaining, you know, better insights. You're probably developing like templates. You're being becoming more efficient, um, having more wins. So I would really consider your experience and your expertise and showcase examples and case studies. I think this is always a really great thing when you are talking with new um with new clients. It's really showcasing how you've helped your clients. And I think that it's, if you are, I know it could be scary to adjust your, your pricing or to go like even to double your prices. Um, and so what I've done in the past as well is that I'm like, you know what, I'm going to increase it like, and slowly get to 
what my goal, what my hourly rate goal is, um, for example. And I think it's a really great exercise to write down like your experience, um, to write down your wins, because it could be a confident booster for yourself to be like, yes, I have done all of, you know, I have done all of this. Um, obviously, we want to factor in all of your costs. So you're probably getting like more programs or like investing maybe into moving into a new office or whatnot. So just make sure that you also factor in those costs and then taxes, right? Don't forget uh, about your taxes. Um, and I would also think about your clients, right? Like, what are they looking for? Because I've had, um, I've had clients of mine that they, um, that they've had people tell them like, oh, I thought because your price was too low for like consulting that, that makes the people think like, oh, maybe that's not going to be the best person for me. So also consider like, what are your, what are the perceptions and what are your clients looking for? Um, but I'm pretty sure that we can always go up, especially if you've been doing this for a while, you haven't adjusted your prices. I would even consider adjusting your prices on a quarterly basis. Yeah, so excellent. I mean, and just generally prices go up, you know, no one's unfamiliar as a consumer with things increasing in price. So don't be shy. <laughs> Increase those prices, right? Um, okay, so we do have um, a question. Uh, Penny, I'm going to kick this one to you. Um, it's about marketing plan. And Wondering what did you prioritize in your marketing plan? Yes, that is a great question. And I'm going to say that we are still evolving our marketing plan for one thing. So just know it's not all buttoned up <laughs> on our end. Um, for us, we really started with um, tr really developing the market marketing plans around where we were selling and like the the places where we were trying to to um increase our um our uh landing on a shelf and where we wanted to really sell um so one of the areas that we are not very good at i'll say is social media and i know most people will say oh you've got to have this great social media presence i think that is true um, we have managed to maintain success without having a great social media presence. I don't advise it. What we have done well is, for example, um, we are a new registered vendor with Caesars Entertainment. So it's like 60 casinos across the country. Um, and then we're about to launch in Kroger. With them, the on-site demos has what is what moved our product. So we went on site, we actually did like taste test, we had like a taste game where we could, we were trying to see if people could taste the difference between the Kentucky bourbon caramel and the Tennessee whiskey caramel. So having a little a gamifying our marketing approach, but it was very much so in person um, and on site. It worked very well, but that's not really scalable. So one of the things that we really need to do immediately behind that is to, is to scale the social media presence really. Um, but I say that in spite of the fact that you must have the social media presence, don't forget that having like a grassroots boots on the ground team to push your, if, especially if it's a product is also important as well in your marketing strategy. Yes. Love that. Love that. Okay. There's so many questions. You guys are a really active group. They Penny and Vinny, they're hearing you and they have like, our attendees have something to say. I love that. Um, okay, our next question. Um, agrees that cheaper is not always better, but he is hitting a roadblock when it comes to his current price structure and client acquisition. So recently as a service-based firm, he's been considering changing his price structure to something more standard and not size-based and wondering if there's any advice. Oh, she, I'm so sorry. Oh, goodness, so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> so she is wondering any advice for this. Uh, Vidya, I'd love to start with you. 
Yeah. So a couple of things that I'm thinking about, like when you're talking about client acquisition, then I'm wondering, like, do you either have to either narrow down who you're serving or do you, yeah, like I, I would really think of like, who am I serving? Do I need to narrow that, narrow that down? Am I trying, am I being way too general? Because sometimes that could really help when we really focus on really serving a particular group with a particular problem, need, or a desire. And I know that personally, that's really helped me in my business is when I started really focusing on only financial projections and only on finances because before I wanted to help everybody. I'm like, yes. If someone's like, will you help me do a flyer? I'm like, okay. And I was just trying to be really helpful. But what I realized is that then your messaging is very general and that it's harder to attract all sorts of folks instead of like a very particular group of people. So I would really just yeah, I would really want to ask myself, like, am I serving the people that I want to serve? Can I narrow that target market down? I would also just take a look at what services you're providing. And if you do want to go with like a standard base pricing, then I would say like you have to make sure that you're able to deliver that service within X amount of hours that it works out with that you really understand what what are the costs associated with it. Um, so that you're not losing money or you're not spending 50 hours doing something. Um, so sometimes size, depending on what type of services you do provide, sometimes the size of the business does have an impact. So um, if it's something that you could do with an X amount of time and you've like mastered it, then I think it could be a good idea to set that standard pricing for that particular service. That makes so much sense. and. We are seeing that, okay, that's such a great answer. And we have one final question. I know we are right, we're right on time, but we can fit in this one last question. So it's, um, what are the benefits and drawbacks of charging an hourly rate versus a flat rate for a service-based business? So um, I wanna kick it to Penny. Yes. Um. Hourly rate versus flat rate for service base. I would say that one of the factors that I think is important to knowing which way to go is how differentiated are and how specialized you are with the service that you provide. Um, I think if you are highly specialized, hourly rates actually um, could be the best way to lean. And this is because there, there's not there's not a lot of, if, if you know that there's not a lot of competition for people who do this very specific thing within engineering or within management or fill in the blank, then I think you can get by with, with sticking with an hourly rate. And even with that, and with that hourly rate, the other thing it's going to do is it's going to allow you to kind of build almost like um, quasi law firm style, right? So if you send an email, you're getting billed 15 minutes for just someone opening up an email, uh, for you opening up an email to answer a question, even if it took you two minutes, two minutes to respond, right? So highly specialist, specialized, I say hourly rate. If you're more of a generalist, um, you could do a hybrid approach. You could have, well, to prepare your taxes, it's this flat rate. If you know, with the with these kind of basic um uh, um, tiers that you are saying that this, this client is meeting, right? So you could take a tiered approach as well. So I also would say that you don't have to be one or the other all the time. You could have a flat rate for certain clients in areas where you're highly specialized. You could also have a tiered flat rate. So that way you don't have to just charge the flat rate across the board for every single thing. You can really differentiate it so that you don't find yourself losing out on going with a flat rate. So you could kind of tier your flat rate as well and don't be afraid of hybrid approaches. Um, I think um, in individuals or corporations who are out seeking consultancy or that type of support, they're kind of used to paying both styles anyway. 
So why limit yourself on how you charge? Love that. My goodness, we are right at the top of the hour, but you know I couldn't take miss an opportunity to get another question in. So I want to thank both uh, Dr. Penny Mickey and V. Diana Ponce for coming today and sharing so much expertise. I mean, we have seen you in the chat. Thank you all for attending and being engaged. And we hope you feel more prepared to go and increase those profit margins in your business. Uh, if you have a few minutes, please take the survey and we will see you all in the next one. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you.